to get the PowerPoint presentation up on the screen, uh, then we can get going here. Kendall, do you have a, I see you have your hand up. You want to say something? Okay. All right, everybody, uh, hopefully you can see the chapter 10 screen on your, uh, if you can, if you can give me a thumbs up on your screen, please, to let me know that you can see that, and then we'll get going. Awesome. Thank you. Perfect. So the way I do my lessons, for those who have not uh, had a class with me, there's a lot of information we're going to learn today about the disinfection. Uh, that's going to apply to both the water treatment and the water distribution. For those of you who are new, uh, who are in Mike's other class, uh, my name is Michael Furlot. Uh, I've been in the water and wastewater industry for 23 years. Um, I specialize in water treatment and uh, in teaching water treatment courses as well as uh, running water treatment facilities. I also have experience in distribution and wastewater. Um, I have, um, I'm a level four um, certified uh, water treatment um, operator. Um, and I currently manage a plant in um, a small town in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, we produce about 88 million liters uh, a day, uh, a conventional water treatment plant. So it's four o'clock in the morning for me. So I apologize if I'm just waking up. It is also minus 15 outside today. So it's a very chilly day. So I got my sweater on as well. Um, so it's both cold and dark, but it's uh, good to have everybody here. At any time, if there's some questions, uh, I have the chat function up, I can see it. Uh, also, um, you know, you can put your hand up and I'll try to get to you as we go through the lecture. I have about a 76 slides this morning to go through. There's a lot of information on those slides. And for those of you who are looking to write a certification exam, I will point out the important pieces. And I believe that the presentation will be available uh, via YouTube after this. So if you need to review. So what are the objectives here of the dis uh, disinfection? Is let's explain the purpose of disinfection and describe some of the um, the ways it works, right? And what are the factors that, that actually change it or make it worse or make it better? Some common disinfection terms, and we're gonna talk about some of the chemicals and some of the different methods to disinfect. Um, of course, too, there's some mistakes operators make, and we're gonna discuss those a little bit, and hopefully you learn a little bit about how chlorine operates. So what is disinfection? By definition, it's removing or destroying or inactivating. They don't like to use the word kill, so it's mostly destroying or inactivating pathogenic organisms. And those, those are, are bacteria that could make you sick. And why do we do that? It would protect public health, right? You protect your customers. They don't want to drink water that's contaminated, so we make sure that it's nice and safe. So really, a little bit of math here, disinfection is the removal and inactivation of any of these uh, pathogenic organisms. So that word might show up. So if you, you can uh, write that word down, I'll just kind of write right here, pathogenic. That's really, and that's disease causing, and that's really important. Disinfections required uh, for surface water and some groundwater. So 
in the past, groundwater didn't always have to be uh, disinfected because it really had very limited uh, interaction with the surface. And of course, you know, surface water, we're going to learn that uh, between all the courses here in, the, uh, in a couple of weeks, but there's a lot of contamination that can happen in surface water because humans are in contact with it. So it's really important to disinfect those. Also, we talk a little bit about groundwater that's under the influence of surface water and they call that goody. That shows up on the test sometimes. And what goody means is that the water is not in the ground long enough when it goes to your well. So it might be fed from a nearby stream or a nearby river and it, it goes too quickly or hasn't had time to be in the ground long enough to disinfect. And so we have to pretend or treat it like it's surface water. Depending on where you live, there's always a minimum disinfection level that must be maintained. That means there has to be some sort of protection for the tap or for your customer's tap. For here, I know in my system here, I have 33,000 customers and every customer has to have a chlorine residual of 0.2 milligrams per liter at the tap. And that's the requirement that I have to meet for my system here. Typical requirements, and they, they look at these things called logs, and you can see this, 99 point, or 99% is two logs, and that's for inactivation or removal of viruses. And this is, again, things are gonna make you sick. For surface water, it's a little bit more strict, okay? You got that two log removal of cryptosporidium, which is a pretty nasty um, chlorine resistant um, uh, protozoa. And then we have 99.9, .9, which is called three log. And of course, 99.99, .99, which is four log. And that's for Giardia and viruses. So a little bit more strict only because the surface water is in contact more with humans and animals. And again, more contamination. So again, disinfection is a process to deliberately reduce all these pathogens, uh, whether that's protozoas or bacterias. Um, and we go through all these other processes. It removes colors and stuff, but disinfection is more for the bacteria, and that's what we're here to do. There's two types, and these are really important to understand that primary disinfection deactivates all these nasty um, protozoas or bacteria. That's really important. That's your job, right? Get rid of these things. But then there's a secondary disinfection. And that means that it has to keep residual in your system. So in case in the future, there's contamination. So if it's between your treatment facility and your customer in the pipe, something happens, there's something there that will disinfect um, just in case something happens. So primary and secondary is really important. Primary does the job that you want it to do at your treatment plant but you need to have that disinfection um, residual or protection as it's going through the pipes. Some places pre-chlorinate, and that's to do a number of different things. Chlorine can act as two things. They can actually act as an oxidizer, which means it could remove some iron and manganese. It could uh, control bacteria or LGs or anything coming in before you do your treatment. Um, where post chlorine, which is pretty typical, that's when you're done your treatment and you're gonna put some chlorine in to disinfect and have a residual going to your customer. Sometimes your systems are really big and if they're really big, the chlorine residual does not last out there and you'd have to add some chlorine in your system. That is called rechlorination. So there's three things, pre, post, and rechlorination. And those are the three. Sometimes when you're cleaning, you have to superchlorinate, and that's the application of a high dose chlorine. And that sometimes has to be done for cleaning purposes or if there's an issue with um, a bacteria or algae or something that there's, you have to shock or superchlorinate that body of water. Of course, it can't be used because you have to dechlorinate it so it's safe for drinking water.
Chlorine is usually what's used out there. That's pretty typical. Um, some systems use a combination of different. Uh, they use maybe something called ozone or UV, and we're going to learn a little bit about that in the next hour. So you'll understand where you can use these things and where it may be not a good idea. The problem is, though, that in order to keep a residual, you need to have a chlorine. It's the only product out there that's going to give you that secondary or that residual protection afterwards. Ozone and UV do not. So keep that in mind. It, a lot of people like to get away from chlorine, but it does not um, leave a residual protection in the lines. Some of the ones we'll talk about a little bit, chlorine, of course, chlorine dioxide, which um, is not widely used, but it's out there, and ozone and ultraviolet. Uh, again, I mentioned that the most commonly used uh, disinfectant for drinking water is going to be chlorine. Why? It's cheap. It works. And again, it can, it can uh, be uh, put in safely, uh, whether that's uh, through liquid, it could be through a uh, powder or a gas form. It's low cost. Um, people know how to use it. Some of what happens too is things in your water system is going to put a demand or they're going to use up chlorine. And one of them are going to be organics. And I always look at organics is equal to color. And throughout this whole treatment process, if you think about color and organics are very similar. So when I use the word organics, I'm going to mean color as well. And microorganisms found in the raw water source puts a large demand on your disinfection. So the more color and the more microorganisms, uh, the more chlorine you're going to need to kill this. Certain cysts though, and we talked about certain cysts and viruses can be resistant to say chlorine. Cryptosporidium, which happens uh, in Canada here, we see it all the time. And that's unfortunate. We, chlorine will not uh, touch it. So we have to definitely rely on filtration to remove that because the chlorination will not work. So that's pretty scary sometimes. Regulations and what they're going to talk about in the test is that there has to be a residual level of disinfection. And we're going to talk about this a little bit when we get into some, some more of the chemistry part of But the residual basically is a level of disinfection in the treated water after treatment and it prevents the recontamination of the water. And that's usually in your pipe network. Some places in Canada here use uh, truck fills because the ground is always frozen and the water is delivered by trucks instead. So you can imagine it has to be put into a truck, taken out of a truck and put into a person's house. And sometimes uh, there's a lot of uh, potential for contamination. Some of the forms of chlorine, and we talked a little bit about this, and these do show up on the test. So really take note of this. Calcium hypochlorite. And when you see the word calcium, that always means it's going to be in a, a powdered form or a granular form, uh, more of a solid. And it's only 65 and 70% available chlorine. It's not 100% strength, so it's only 70%. And that's a question that's asked often. Sodium hypochlorite is the liquid form. So when it says sodium, it's usually in a liquid form. And this is your typical... Um, you know, household bleach is, is sodium hypochlorite. It's usually in about a 5%, 12% is typical. The plant I operate, I have 12%. Some of the new products out there is that some of the plants, bigger ones and some small ones, they actually use an on-site generator and they produce their own chlorine out of salt water. It produces a 0.8% solution. And basically, they zap it with um, high amperage and uh, low voltage, and it will actually produce a low 0.8% chlorine. Um, and I know a few plants that do actually use this. 
One thing to note about a hypochlorite, whether it's calcium or sodium, and this is super important, that when you add it to water, it increases the pH. It makes it go up. So always remember that, because that is a test question at some point, uh, that it does increase the pH. Sometimes you get this 12% stuff. So when they mean 12% chlorine, it's actually 120,000 milligrams per liter. That's the strength. And that's what's added to the water. Depending on the type of feed rate or the pumps you have, some places dilute the product to allow the pumps to pump it easier. But of course, if you can add water to the solution, you have to use it right away. So typically it's better just to use it or purchase it in the strength uh, that you're gonna use it and size the pump accordingly. Calcium again comes in a powdered form. It also can come in a puck form. I see this sometimes in puck forms in some pools. Um, it must be mixed with water for it to make a solution. So when you mix this stuff, you have to let it sit for 24 hours. And then once uh, it's mixed, it's got to be used. It doesn't have a long shelf life. So once it's mixed and it's got to be used fairly quick. Again, it's about a pH of 12 and we'll talk about pH in a few minutes. Very caustic product. It does raise the pH. Um, and all these compounds can cause fire if mixed with acids. So it's really important to keep these things separated or else uh, bad things will happen and we don't want that. So make sure the storage is proper. Now gas was really popular. In the 60s and 70s, chlorine gas was really popular. Um, it was very cheap to buy, um, but it's 100% strength, okay? It's a compressed gas. It's under pressure and then it goes through some processes and you've got a chlorinator that will add it to the water. The problem here is that um, it can, when released, it can increase by 460 times. So a little bit of gas can really fill up a room very quickly. It's, um, it can be very poisonous. It's also called mustard gas and it was used in the war. So it can actually melt down the mucous membranes in your nose and mouth very, very quickly. It could do a lot of damage. Uh, so proper care and handling of chlorine gas is key or else you can hurt yourself very quickly. One thing about chlorine gas that, that should be noted that this actually decreases the pH. Whereas the liquid stuff increases pH, the gas actually brings the pH down. And that is also a question that you may be asked. So remember, liquid and solid uh, calcium and sodium bring the pH up, whereas the chlorine gas brings the pH down. It's really dangerous. Like I, it's lethal. It, it can kill you at 0.1% uh, error by volume. It is heavy, so if it does get into a trouble and you get a leak, it's gonna go to the floor. Um, and again, once it does, it's extremely corrosive uh, with moisture. So it will actually rust um, everything very, very quickly. So very, very careful when you're dealing with these products, especially the gas that you have the proper protection. I'll touch briefly on chlorine dioxide. It's, it's not widely used. Um, it uses a, a, a combination of chlorine and chlorine dioxide. And again, it has to be produced on site. So you'll get a chlorine dioxide generator. Um, it's expensive, but the one thing is quite explosive. If done right or put, um, it works fantastic. If done wrong, it could go wrong really badly. Uh, to the point of explosion. The systems are expensive and again, lots of training. Um, it, it works very similar to chlorine, uh, but it doesn't uh, make as many byproducts. It's not widely used though, so, but I just gotta let you know that it does exist. For those of you in the distribution and even some treatment, you guys go out and do chlorine tests. And 
easy. Mathematically speaking, it's pretty easy. You put chlorine in, that chlorine combines with bacteria, and what's left over is basically free chlorine. So that combined chlorine, chlorine could be called that primary disinfection, where the free chlorine left over is your secondary. That's what's left over to protect your lines. Pretty simple math. We'll talk a little bit about chloramines. And chloramines are a chemical compound formed in water uh, by combining chlorine with ammonia. Now, also when organics, so color or organics combined with chlorine and even bacteria, it will create a chloramine. Now, here's where things go wrong very quickly. New operators and even some older operators always make this mistake. Those chloramines are the pool smell, the bleach smell that you guys think it is. And so what happens, your number one complaint when you add chlorine to your system, your customers go, my water smells like chlorine, right? And a new operator, what do they do? They go, they go, yep, my water does smell like chlorine. Oh, it smells like a pool. It smells like a hot tub. It smells, that actually means that there's not enough chlorine or that there's too much um, bacteria in the water. It's actually a bad thing. If you are chlorinating right, there is no smell. The biggest mistake operators make, they go, oh, it smells like chlorine. They turn the chlorine down. And that is a big mistake. And we'll talk about why. If you can smell it, so if, take a pool for instance. If you can smell your pool, it's usually dirty. I can have a clean glass of water and put lots of chlorine in it. It won't have a smell. If I had a glass of dirty water and I put just a drop of chlorine in it, it's going to smell like a pool. It's going to smell like that bleach smell. And that just means there's not enough chlorine in it. And we'll talk about why. Chlorine's added. Chlorine combines with those organics and chloramines are formed. Now they did, they, they combined, they did the job they needed to do, which is fantastic. But now the water smells terrible. And so we're gonna talk about how we fix that. What actually happens in there when you add that chlorine to all these organics is that it reacts with the ammonia and the ammonia it forms, and ammonia we can call ammonia the organics basically, right? Bacteria and organics, they're all, we're gonna call it the same thing. And they're gonna form compounds that make up the, what they call the combined chlorine residual or chloramines. And these are the three that we're gonna deal with. There's gonna be monochloramine, dichloramine, and trichloramine. And these really, these are the things that you smell. This is what you think bleach smells like. It's that swimming pool smell. We don't want this in our water. Right? Customers don't like it. They smell it. They go, oh, I don't like this. I'm just going to use my pen here. So, basically, this is your chlorine residual here. And this is my chlorine added. So, as I add chlorine, what happens is that you can see this line here. I'm creating an army that's going to fight for me. So water and organics are going to um, meet with the chlorine. They're going to form those, those, tri, or, uh, those monochloramines or chloramines. They're going to create that pool smell. What happens here, you can see right about there in my pen here, it reaches a point. That's that point there at the top. That means that I've combined my chlorine with everything that's in that water, right? All the organics are combined with um, my chlorine. And it's gonna smell, it's gonna smell like a swimming pool. Is it safe to drink? Yeah, is it gonna taste bad? Yeah, really bad. In order to make this water taste better, and this is where people go wrong. They go, oh, I'm going to turn the chlorine down. Well, if you turn it down, you're still gonna make it worse. If you turn the chlorine up, 
what happens is that that army, that army of chloramines that you built, we have to oxidize those or remove those now from the water. So we build our army of chloramines, they combine, they make that water safe. And now with a little bit more chlorine, that chlorine is going to oxidize the organics or oxidize the chloramines, remove the smell. Once the, all the smell and chloramines are removed, we get to a break point and that's right here. I created my army, I destroyed my army and what's left now is I got this free available chlorine that's not combined with any organics or ammonia and that's what we want. That's a water that's safe to drink and does not smell like chlorine. So always remember that, that if you can smell the chlorine, that's a problem. That usually means that A, you got a stagnant line, there's too much combined chlorine in there, or you need to oxidize that chlor or those chloramines. And by oxidizing it, I'm meaning using chlorine more to oxidize those smells. So for those of you on the distribution world, that means two things. You either have to add a little bit more chlorine or you have to flush your system more to keep the water fresher to allow, um, to not allow these compounds to form. Sometimes with dead end mains, you see that because there's not a lot of water. So good chlorine water comes in and all of a sudden there's a lot of bacteria in that dead end main and they combine together and make us really nasty pool smell. And that just tells me that you need to flush a little bit more. So again, we talked a little bit about that. We created the, the uh, chloramines, and now the second part of this is oxidation or chlorine destruction. And that's the part that we get wrong sometimes. We gotta make sure we add enough chlorine to, to get rid of these chlor chloramines. That's on that downward slope. So most of the chloramines have been oxidized. Breakpoint has been reached. From breakpoint on, any further additions of uh, chlorine will give an uh, increase in free chlorine. So that's what you want. That's the true um, reading. Now, people ask me, how do I know where I am in the curve? And I look at it this way. And I'll use my pen here. When we talk about total chlorine, so if I add three chlorine, three, and I'm talking three milligrams per liter, and I'm using my mouse, so I apologize for my penmanship. I'll try that again. It's hard to do it there. So if I add three chlorine, 3.0, and this is in milligrams per liter, right? And my combined is 2.5. I only have 0.5 left, and that's my free chlorine. I'll answer the question in the morning in, in a second, but let me finish this thought first. If I had this 3.0 and I only had 0.5 of combined, that means I've had, I have 2.5 free. You can see here, this one at 2.5, there's more combined. This one has less. The less the number, the more to the right of the curve you are. You want a low combined number. The higher the number in the middle combined means you get more smell. The less here, so less smell, more residual, more smell, less residual. And that's how you, it's really important when you take free chlorine readings that you should also take total as well. So basically that total chlorine is what you had, right? What happens in the middle. So sometimes you have to add, you know, so that second example here, this is way too much chlorine. So if I know that I only have this much demand, then I can, you know, bring this right back. 
So you have to kind of look at both. If you're only doing free chlorine, you're only looking at half the equation. So that's your basic math. Total chlorine is chlorine that you add. It will do some stuff in there. It's really important to look at, take a total chlorine and a free chlorine and to figure out what is happening in the middle. And that will tell you if you need to add more chlorine or less chlorine. So there's a question on the floor here. So that would mean that the free chlorine will never leave uh, that chlorine scent. So if I put chlorine in, um, that's your total chlorine. And it doesn't, it's just what form that chlorine is. That chlorine is either combined with organics or that chlorine will, if there's no organics, it'll just keep going as free. So the math always has to add up. You add this much, some of it's going to combine and then at the end of it, you have the free chlorine. For those of you who test chlorine out in the system or at your plants, there's a couple of different methods that are used, right? Ampliometric is used a fair bit. And that's, uh, you know, not the most widely used. It's, it's usually in a lab situation because it's way more accurate it uses uh, a millivolt signal. Um, it's a little, you know, it's not as easy to take out in the field. What you guys probably use more is something called a DPD or colorimetric method. And that's the one where you put the powder pillows in and it turns uh, a color and you analyze that color. And that's usually the DPD method. That is probably the most used um, method in the field in some smaller labs. Some places and bigger ones have chlorine analyzers out in the system so you can monitor 24 seven what's happening at your plant or out in your system. I have eight online residual analyzers in my system but I still go out and test as well to make sure that these analyzers are correct. Um, you never have to um, rely on these analyzers. They're good guides, but always know better than you have to check them all the time. These are the two different units we spoke of. This is an older um, colorimetric method, DPD. You can see the maroon colored liquid. Or to the right here, this is an ampliometric tester. And I see these in some labs. And sometimes they are way more accurate. Here's another important thing for chlorine that most people forget happens. Chlorine deactivates the pathogens, and, right, the bacteria and the viruses by breaking the chemical bonds in their molecules. It scrambles up their DNA. It allows them to either be deactivated or so that they cannot reproduce anymore. When I add that chlorine, it doesn't matter what form, but if I add chlorine to water, a couple of things happen chemically. It produces these two things, and these are probably super important things to realize. It, it makes an acid, so we're just gonna call that an acid and an ion. Acid and an ion, and it, that, that's exactly what it does. It breaks down to an acid and an ion. If you can just think of it that way, we're, we're in good shape. The thing is here, this acid is strong. It's a strong disinfectant. It's fantastic. We want more acid. We don't want a lot of ion. Unfortunately, both things are created, but if we want a good disinfection, we want an acid. And it's super important that we know how we make that acid go because we, we don't want a lot of ion. With that acid, it's split into a couple things, hydrochloric acid and oxygen. So basically what happens is that the hydrochloric acid melts the cell wall of these bacteria. The oxygen goes in and it, it kills everything. It will scramble everything. It's a good oxidizer, right? Adding oxygen. So this is great. What's interesting here that pH near seven, more acid is formed. 
So if my water is closer to pH 7, more acid will form. And that's perfect. That's what we want. What happens, though, as the pH goes up from 7 and it's approaching, say, 8 or better, the acid stops happening and more ions happen. And it says here, ion is not a good disinfectant. And after pH of 8, most of the chlorine formed is of an ion form. So you can have the same amount of chlorine put in. At pH 7, this thing's going to work excellent. If it's pH 8, it's not going to work very good at all. And you've added the same amount of chlorine. The disinfecting power of the chlorine in water is based on this pH. If the pH is too high, it doesn't work well. It works terribly. So you think you have a lots of chlorine and good chlorine residual, but in actual fact, if your chlorine or if your pH is closer to eight, you have very little disinfecting power. It takes a lot of work to disinfect. If your pH is closer to seven, this thing's gonna work fantastic. It takes way less chlorine to do the job. So really always check a pH, it's super important to see where you are in this acid and this ion thing because you want to make sure you're in the right spot because if you're not in the right spot, that could be a problem. Here's kind of the chart on it and you can see with the pH and I'll get my little drawing guy here. You can see here's our pH down here. This is the acid on this side, on the left. On the right is the ion. And you can see here the, the, the disinfecting percent power. If I have pH of six, look at that. This is working pretty good up here. As it gets down here to pH eight, you can see where we are now, we're over here. We're like 40% effective versus 100%. It doesn't take long. So may, always make sure you're testing pH because this will tell you where you are in your curve. Very interesting that, you know, swimming pools use this concept more than free chlorine. They use something called ORP or oxidation reduction potential. And that does show up on the test sometimes. And that's what this concept is, that disinfecting power changes with pH. So it's more important for a swimming pool to control pH in order to control the power or the amount of disinfecting power that chlorine that's added. Sometimes it's lost on the water treatment industry um, because they look at free chlorine only, but you have to look at everything, free and total chlorine to see where you are on the curve, but you also really need to see where your pH is to understand acid to ion relationship. Let's talk a little bit about the chlorine equipment that we have out there. And this is for the gas. I'm finding even here, the use of gas is reducing. And over the years, because of how dangerous it is, like I mentioned, it is like mustard gas. So in order to handle this product, you have to have the masks and, and the, the, the scuba suits and protect yourself because this could do a lot of damage to uh, and, uh, even kill you as an operator and your customer. So how do we do this safely? The safest way to get gas and get it to um, into your water is basically use a vacuum chlorinator. You put everything under vacuum. So what happens if there's a little leak, it will suck air in instead of product going out. You tend not to want a pressurized system. You want a vacuum system. These units, and you can see a picture of a smaller unit, usually is mounting right on the cylinder. 
And the vacuum chlorinator, that's what they're going to call it, ensures that the gaseous chlorine, the 100% strength stuff, is always under a partial vacuum until it reaches the water or the point of application. And that keeps it safer for you as the operator. But keep in mind, this stuff is still very nasty. And if you're dealing with it, always, always uh, make sure you have the proper precautions, the masks. This will do a lot of damage. Gas chlorinators are used for the gaseous chlorine application. It's withdrawn through a valve and delivered by vacuum controlled uh, solution um, into the water stream. You got to also make sure that your piping is corrosion resistant. You're going to use a plastic pipe. You're going to make sure the glue that is used for the pipe is the proper glue for chlorine as well. It, you have to make sure because if you don't use the right glue or the right pipe, this stuff, remember, it creates hydrochloric acid, HCl, and that will eat up uh, metal pipes and incorrect glue. Just be very careful. The chlorine delivers in a couple of different ways. Cylinders are, are very typical. Um, they're made of steel and they have a fusible metal plug. So if there's a pressure buildup um, in the event of a, a fire, they will blow out so that it will protect you. This is always a test question. The plug will melt at 70 to 74 degrees C. That's pretty hot if you think about it. Also too, something to think about is cylinders will freeze if the chlorine withdraws too high. So for those cylinders that you see, um, 18 kilograms of chlorine per day can be withdrawn by a, a cylinder. If not, if you're gonna try to get more out of that, it will freeze. It will literally freeze and then you're in trouble. So if you're gonna do more than 18 kilograms per day, you might have to have more than one cylinder online or move to a bigger a cylinder called a tonner. They come in these two, 150 pound cylinder or 68 kg or um, chlorine tonner. Here's a picture of two. Typical 150 cylinders are on the right or on the left, the yellow, whereas the bigger tonners are on the right. So bigger systems run a tonner system. You can see uh, on the ones here on the right, they have some precautions here. This thing right here is your vacuum chlorinator. Right here, there's two banks of it. So that will allow you to adjust the rate of flow. This has a really neat system though. These yellow things on this uh, right here, this is an automatic turn off. If there was ever an issue or a leak, it allows the operator to turn these off remotely from outside the room. Whether this is 150 or tonners, as you see here, these have to be in a sealed room, proper ventilation. If, you know, it, because it will, if released, can do a lot of damage. When we talked a little bit about chlorine, and I'll use blue here, if chlorine is released out of here by accident, it's going to go to the floor because we talked about that earlier, that it's 2.5 um, heavier than air. So two and a half times heavier than the air, so it's gonna hit the bottom. So it's really important, if this is my chlorine room, that the, the vent should be, air should be coming in from the top and leaving from the bottom. If that's the opposite, that could do a lot of damage. That means that you're pulling chlorine gas through the air. And if you're standing there, that's a problem. So ventilation is super important that air is coming in, fresh air from the top where bad air goes out the bottom on a chlorine room. More uh, design changes for chlorine rooms happened in, in the last say 10 years where that instead of just venting to the atmosphere, that it would go to something called a scrubber. A chlorine scrubber will, will clean up 
the chlorine gas and make it uh, not as dangerous so it could be released to the environment. Some of the gas equipment that we're going to see here are uh, pressure gauge, again, uh, indicates the chlorine pressure. These are important things to keep an eye on. Um, gas supply, that's going to come from your containers that we just looked at, tonner or a 150. We want to make sure that there's a constant vacuum on that chlorinator, so that's your uh, vacuum regulator unit. Sometimes uh, you want that pressure relief because if you get that pressure build up in the system, you don't want a pipe burst. Uh, it will relieve gas pressure. There'll be a, there'll be a vent. I'll go back there. There'll be a vent. Uh, discharges any uh, excess chlorine gas to the atmosphere. And again, very careful, you guys, that that, that is going to be uh, at a place where there's public. Um, if there's public there, uh, that could do a lot of damage. You need some sort of gas inlet, right? And this allows the chlorine gas to the chlorinator. Gas is gonna flow from the container, which is that 150 or that tonner, through supply lines to the inlet and making sure that it's the proper materials and that they're maintained. Again, changing these materials out all the time because Again, the acids that are created during this process can do a lot of damage. A lot of these heat um, pipes are heated or they're in a room that's heated. And again, um, we want to make sure the chlorine gas actually boils at such a low temperature. So much lower than what we're used to for, for, for us. So when it's under this vacuum, it boils at a very, very low temperature. But we got to make sure that um, this gas is always kind of uh, heated up a little bit. You got a vacuum gauge, of course. You're going to have a rotameter, and you're going to see where you know that's your rate of flow that you can adjust. You a lot of the newer systems that can be adjusted through a SCADA system, or you could be standing there and adjust the knob itself. And you get that's your differential regulating or reducing valve. Again, inside there, there's going to be a plug or some sort of orifice in there, and that's going to help um, uh, with the regulation of the gas. And these things wear out, so you need to make sure that these are rebuilt at, at all the time because you got it's like a, a carburetor on, a, on an automobile. You have to always make sure that these things are, are maintained and, and correct. Some other things that are happening, this is more for the relief valve side of things. One big thing is this diaphragm too. Inside that chlorine regulator is a, a, a diaphragm, a check valve. And again, these diaphragms are made of a material that over time they're going to break down. And you got to make sure that that is serviced regularly. Also, there's going to be some issues with that. Again, uh, your um, feed, uh, you can do it manually. A lot of the new ones are done through the SCADA system. You need an injector. And basically what happens is the vacuum is usually created by a pump. And it's when water is uh, flowing through the line, it actually creates a vacuum that's pulling the uh, gas out of the cylinder through the regulator and allows gas to enter. But it's always done usually through a water supply that's creating a vacuum. It goes through an injector, which actually mixes or injects that chlorine gas into that water supply. And then basically you got a solution discharge. So that solution that's made right from that slipstream of water becomes your chlorinated water. No different than the liquid that you see and buy as sodium hypochlorite. It's a lot of work to do the same thing. And again, from an ease of use and for safety, a lot of municipalities have turned away from the gas and moved to hypochlorite, our liquid solution. Here's a kind of a overview here, and I'll get my little pen out here. I can show you 
So what you have here is basically um, a chlorine uh, cylinder. You have gas at the top and liquefied chlorine. The always question that's asked is if there was a leak, what's more dangerous, the liquid or the gas? And the answer is the liquid. You do not want that liquid getting out of there. It, it, is, it, it will be a, a real mess to clean up. And it expands so quickly. It creates so much gas that it's better that if there was ever an issue um, with a leaky tunner or a leaky cylinder, that it's upright so that the gas is at the top of the leak or where the leak is going to be. Because I, you want, I'd rather have gas release than liquefied chlorine. And so that's really important. That gas is going to go up. They're going to put the chlorinator on this part here with a yoke. And the yoke here is sealed with a, a washer. And I'll show you the washer here in a second. I think I threw it uh, right here. That's your washer. So this is a lead washer. And this lead washer goes right in here between um, the yoke and the chlorinator. It connects that cylinder to the chlorinator. Now, when you put that on and cinch, you know, tighten that up, it creates a fingerprint and it can only be used once. Once you've uh, tightened that up, as soon as you release that, that is no good anymore. This washer is no good anymore. It has to be removed every time. So it can only be used once. So if you guys have operators, once that you release that uh, gas or release the chlorinator off the cylinder, this gasket should come out and be destroyed so you don't ever use it again. More chlorine leaks happen because people reuse these washers. So again, that washer is going to go about right here. It's going to seal the cylinder to the chlorinator. Gas is now going to come through. You're going to open it here at the top. Gas is going to come out of here. It's going to go through the chlorinator, right? And you have all in here, you have all your diaphragms and all your safety stuff, and it's going to go through the pipes. And again, under vacuum to a water flow. Water is going to be flowing usually by a pump. It's going to come through here and out to be injected into the water. And this is where the vacuum's created, right here. It creates that venturi, that lower pressure that's going to pull the gas out of the cylinder and deliver it into the water flow. This water flow here is where we create that acid and ion, right? That, that chlorine um, HCl and ion and acid solution that's going to go off to your water source. So don't ever reuse these. That's always a test question. A lead washer is used once and once only. There was a time where people didn't like the lead washer and they used a fiberglass or a different material and that does not work very well. It does cause leaks, it causes issues. It's best to stay with the lead type washer. The lead is soft enough that it will actually see, give a good seal to all the little imperfections, but it creates that fingerprint. It could never be used again once you've tightened it up. So if you tighten it and loosen it to tighten it up again, it's no good. Once it's tightened, that's it. It's done. That's on the gas side. The liquid side's a little easier to deal with. And they call these things hypochlorinators. Typically, they're chemical feed system for the liquid chlorine, right? Whether that's 5% or 12%, it doesn't matter. It could be the calcium hypochlorite solution that you created with the powder, it, but it, it will all be pumped very similarly. You're gonna have a solution tank, right? Whether that's the, a tank that you purchase or a tote of product that you, or something that you've mixed up. You're gonna have a chemical feed pump. And two main types that are used are diaphragm type pump that's used quite a bit, or the one that's in the picture here, which is a peristaltic type pump. 
peristaltics are quite widely used for chlorine uh, because there are direct, they, they don't tend to gas off as much or, or air lock. Um, you're gonna have again piping and tubing and making sure again the piping and tubing are going to be um, as such that it's not gonna create, um, you know, if you have some sort of uh, metal or some sort of piping that's going to cause some issues and you don't want that. Of course, you can have valving in the system as well. Um, making sure again, the valves are a material that is compatible with the chlorine or the product that you're pumping. Some plate, you know, inside you'll have some rubber gaskets in them or just make sure that they're chlorine resistant. Uh, that's, you know, a lot of leaks happen because people don't take the time to make sure that the proper valves or the proper products are, are purchased. Some of the safety stuff, uh, especially on the gas side, always chain containers to prevent falling. So when the uh, tunners or these cylinders, they have to be chained to the wall so they don't fall over. They should have that protective cap on them. If we go back, right there, you can see the protective cap on the yellow ones here. Um, and even the big guys, they have a, like a hub cap that goes over the, the valving. But make sure when they're in storage, like see these yellow ones here, they don't have a chain around them. They should. Um, they also need to be labeled to make sure that they are full or empty. So when I walk into a chlorine room, I should, have, uh, I should know which ones are online, which ones are empty, and which ones are full. And that should always be like, a, they usually have a magnet or something that sticks on them and they should all be secured in some way, uh, usually by a chain. Um, for the big guys here, they'll go on these racks, they call them trunnions, and they, are, they, they will be safe on here. But these ones that are standing up, they need to be chained. Go back over here. Always tag and replace the protective cap. So those are really important safety things, you guys. Make sure that you're, you're, you're doing that at all times. Okay, it's um, five o'clock a.m. my time. Um, it's uh, nine o'clock your time. We're gonna take a five minute break. Uh, Ignatius there, uh, we're gonna do a five minute break and we're gonna come back yeah, in sure. five minutes. Sure, okay, we'll take a break now. Take a five minute bio break and be back. Yes. Okay, we're back. All right, thanks Ignatius. All right, everybody, hopefully we're starting to wake up now and you've learned a little bit so far. We'll uh, continue on here. Um, we're gonna finish up the chlorine part of it, uh, learn a few more things, and then we'll get into a little bit on um, UV and ozone as well today. I think that's also really important to talk about. So uh, hopefully you've learned a little bit a little about uh, chlorine and disinfection. Um, and again, keep in mind that all these things are, uh, can be applied to both water treatment and water distribution. It's very much a shared thing. Um, one thing about disinfection is always the final barrier or the final treatment process in any process that we'll be learning, especially uh, you folk who are taking uh, the water treatment with me carrying on. Um, it's, this will be always the last topic or the last uh, stage in the treatment process. So I'll always keep that in mind as we keep going. We'll talk a little bit more about some um, safety or some tips when you're dealing with gas chlorine and then we'll get into a little bit more here. You can see my screen okay. Back to, it should say chlorine containers. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can, please, just to make sure you can see it. Awesome, thank you. All right, one of the big things too, when we talked about um, the top of the cylinders, right? You have to open it usually with a wrench and it's a really important, and this is a mistake some new operators make, that the wrench has to be very small. It has to be six inches or less. 
if it's any bigger, you can put too much torque on it and you can actually damage the packing that, that seals the, uh, the, the cylinder. So sometimes they're tough to open. If it's tight, strike it with your hand only, right? The heel of your hand only. And if it doesn't go, don't bring out the hammer or anything that could create sparks. <laughs> um, and I've seen that happen before. Um, it, it, you know, keep in mind, this stuff is explosive. And I've seen that they come in, they can't get the little wrench, they'll get the big wrench. And all of a sudden now you have a chlorine leak. If you can't do it, then make sure, uh, just don't use that cylinder. Don't put yourself at risk. So that's why they only give you a small six inch wrench. And that is a test question, that, that's key, that six inch wrench. If it's tight, strike with the heel of your hand only. One complete turn equals maximum open. Now you can turn this thing and turn this thing and open. Have it, and a lot of operators use quarter turn, right? Because in an emergency, if you're all geared up with your, your, your mask on and you've got to get in there and get this gas off now, you don't want to be turning this thing. So a lot of operators, what they'll do is they will turn it open, come back to a quarter turn, and that's really all you need. So that if in an emergency, you can come in, right? And they also leave the wrench on top of the, uh, of the, of the cylinder. So I can come in and quarter turn, quickly turn this thing off now. Super important. A lot of plate, you know, you don't want to be coming in in an emergency and looking for the wrench and figuring out and then this thing's all open. All, you don't have time for that. Keep in mind, you know, this stuff, it's quick. One thing that's not on here and you can write to the side in the margin and somewhere in your book that if I have to test for leaks, I'm going to use a ammonia solution. I usually take a sponge right? And it doesn't, I don't ever have to drip it on there. I just want a little bit. So there's some vapors coming off and I will, I will, you know, run it around the uh, piping that I just did. And if there's some chlorine leak, it reacts with the ammonia and makes a white cloud. And that tells me that there potentially could be a leak. Is there a question out there? Rashad, you got a question? Oh, I guess not. Also to make sure you have enough supply. It's super important to have a 30 or 15 to 30 day supply sometimes. And we talked about these lead washers, never ever reuse it. And that is a test question, you guys. Don't ever reuse them. Sometimes in some of the um, older and some um, not widely used gas systems, they will actually use something called an evaporator. They will put the chlorine cylinder in uh, an immersed heated water bath, like a hot tub almost, right? And that's what creates the pressure to deliver the gas into the system. Some of the gas pressures are usually between 20 and 30 uh, PSI and injector pressure should be uh, greater than 50. Again, these are not testable. This is just more for your information. Each system's going to be a little bit different. Let's talk a little bit about the safety. Um, these are just the general safety practices for, with chlorine. And this is not only with the chlorine gas, but again, chlorine gas is the most lethal of all the products we're going to be using, right? Um, as the strength of the liquid product goes down, the, the safer it is. So 12% to 5% to 0.8%, it gets safer. You have to have a specific training in chlorine and chlorine handling and safety. Um, you know, don't, don't go in there, you know, and I, even when I started, I started, you know, 23 years ago and I did my first chlorine gas change. I did not do it overly safe because I didn't really know but now I do. It's super important, especially for your, the new operators to understand how this could go sideways very quickly. You need a chlorine safety program 
And that should look at your whole system. Training of that program is really key. And, and training for the safety equipment that has to be used, especially in the chlorine gas, right? Because again, you want to protect your eyes, your nose and mouth. You don't want this stuff on there. I've, I've seen some really bad chlorine leaks and some people get really hurt and gone to the hospital because of this. Emergency procedure must be established for chlorine leaks in first aid, right? Because if there's a chlorine leak, it's not only for your own operators, but because of your neighborhood or where your treatment plant is located, when that toxic gas release happens, that's a problem. And you gotta be making sure that um, you're protected. You gotta have a maintenance program. We talked about the pipes. We talked about all the things that could go wrong. Making sure that the maintenance is there. You're calibrating the equipment. You're also calibrating and maintaining the equipment, the masks that make you safe. You have to be fully aware of the hazards, especially with the chlorine gas. When we're dealing with the liquid product, you don't want to spill this stuff on you, right? So again, you're going to make sure that you protect yourself. You're not breathing in any fumes, that you wear the proper gloves, you're wearing the proper uh, rubber suits or whatever you need to do to keep yourself safe. Just to review, again, chlorine is a toxic gas, right? It's got to be stored in a separate room. It has to have proper ventilation, and we talked about the ventilation has to come from the top and leave out the bottom. Each room has to have some sort of chlorine analyzer inside because you want to know if there's a leak. So that's really important. Some places have uh, mounted inside, and even when you go in, you should have a personal one on you so that you're keeping yourself safe. And I mentioned this a little earlier, that leak detection equipment in this case is going to be a squeeze bottle or something with an ammonia solution or a cloth, something that has ammonia on it. Because when the ammonia vapor is in contact with chlorine gas, it creates that white cloud. And if there's a white cloud, there's a problem. And that's the way you check if there's a chlorine leak, if you do not have a leak detection equipment. But I always have everything. I have my personal one, there's one in the room, and I also have my bottle of ammonia solution. And I usually have a little sponge at the bottom. And when I, I go like this around the repair or uh, the pipe that I, I'm concerned with, the double check, that's what I use. There's no white vapor and I'm not getting any readings on my detector, I'm going to be okay. When you're going to do uh, any sort of uh, changes or pipe work, I always have, I personally have a self-contained breathing apparatus, so a scuba type thing. Um, again, it's, it's super important to do. You should follow all the safety precautions. Um, again, Anytime you're dealing with hooking up or decoupling uh, chlorine cylinders. We talked a little bit about the chlorine removal rate and the freezing, and that, that becomes an issue too. So really, really make sure that you're watching your chlorine rate per day or else you'll have to put more than one cylinder or move to the bigger tonners. The next picture I have for you is actually from one of the plants that I used to manage. This here is an on-site generator. And what this does here, and I'll take my little drawing guy here. Oh. Basically, um, I have a big tank of salt over here. So I have a tank of salt, and it is, it's, that's all it is, it's salt. And I brine that salt up so it becomes a salty brine. I'm gonna take that now, I'm gonna pump it into, into this cell. And this clear cell, there's a big electronator and it provides 55 volts DC and 1300 amps. That's a lot of amps. Inside here, what happens is that the chemical reaction, now when I put the electricity to it, it takes the NaCl salt and it turns it into sodium hypochlorite. The byproduct of that is hydrogen gas, and the hydrogen gas gets, it gets uh, 
um, vented off and what's in here is chlorine and it's this is that 0.8 percent it's only 0.8 percent it's low strength you have to add more to your water but it's safer one thing to note about the strength of chlorine the lower the strength the more stable it is so 0.8 is really stable 5 is not as stable 12 is the most not stable. So when you buy 12% sodium hypochlorite, it will degrade in strength very quickly. And by the time you use it from, the, from where you purchase it, it's probably going to be 10.8. And in a couple of months, it might be seven. In a couple of more months, it might be three. It degrades very quickly. Having 0.8%, yes, you need bigger tanks because you're gonna use more of it. But what's good about this is it's very stable and it will remain, it doesn't lose its strength. So you can have a more consistent um, flow. The problem about these units are they're expensive from a capital standpoint. They cost a lot of money to maintain and it takes good power. You need very good power, a lot of power to produce the 55 volts DC or the 1300 amps to, that's required to run these systems. So if you're in a place where the power is, is poor, that could be a problem sometimes. Okay, let's switch gears now into the ultraviolet and then into the ozone. So ultraviolet is, is um, a newer technology. And again, what the biggest thing I want you guys to get your head around is that uh, UV does not have a residual and because it doesn't have a residual it has no protection it's fantastic to kill immediately but it has no protection after that it's that's it it's one time and if you don't get it all that time then down the line or if there's contamination in your pipe network between your treatment plant and your customer then there's a problem Ultraviolet is the disinfection process of passing water by high intensity light source. And this, this light source is immersed in the water. It's in a protective transparent sleeve, right? And this emits the UV waves that um, does the same thing as chlorine. It deactivates that uh, bacteria and the protozoas by denaturing or changing the DNA. So they either die or they um, can't reproduce anymore. When they say dosing uh, UV, it means how much power is emitted from that lamp, right? To give these guys a suntan. The power is, is basically, um, in, it's watts per meters cubed. So what is UV light exactly? So UV light is the light energy and it's between 100 and 400 wavelengths, nanometers. It's located between X-ray and the visible lights in the, in the, in the light spectrum. Um, but we don't use it all. That's a huge wavelength between 100 and 400. So we only use a little bit of that. We use something called UVC. And it's a smaller wavelength. It's between 200 and 280. And that's what's usually used from these lights. That's what gives that power to disinfect or, or denature all these bacteria. UV causes the chemical bonds to form in the, in the DNA or scrambles that DNA a bit and uh, either A, uh, kills or denatures this, um, the bacteria. The problem here though, is that the water has to be super clear. So if there's little bits of turbidity in it, that bacteria can hide as it's going through the light source. So a word called transmittance, and you should underline or think about that word a little bit, transmittance. That's the water clarity. And that's super key in, in order to make sure that you get all the bacteria. Because the water, the less this thing's gonna work. The other thing is exposure period. You have to have enough time for that water to go through the UV contact chamber or else it's not gonna work. And the radiation energy itself. 
When you put a new bulb in, it's quite strong, but over time, it's going to get weaker and weaker. Also too, it's in that quartz sleeve. And if that quartz sleeve gets fouled up with biological slime or metals or hardness, then that can also lead to less um, energy being put out there. So these three factors must be balanced in order to treat all the large volumes of water. Again, this is why the processes upstream like filtration is super important because if it's not done right, then the water is going to have turbidity or dirt to uh, inhibit how much energy that light can give out. The clearer water allows for deeper UV transmittance, and that's just a fancy way of saying more light energy, right? Um, again, every time that water gets more and more turbidity, it gets less and less uh, likely that it's going to be treated properly. Suspended sediments will absorb that light or reflect it away from the bacteria. So we don't want that. We want that out of there. It's super important. You know, like the other treatment processes, this stuff is going to go through uh, a contact chamber. And it's either sometimes in a channel or it, it's a, another vessel in itself. This is a, this is a pretty typical one here. Um, basically, water's gonna come in, it's gonna flow through this unit and out it goes. And you can see in the unit, there's the, the bulb is sitting inside a quartz sleeve and it's it got the energy going out, right? Now, it's really important that, that we do the maintenance. Sometimes there's a, uh, a wiper or a, uh, that'll run on the inside of that to keep that quartz sleeve clean, um, but it's super important to keep an eye on it. A lot of the new units have, it'll actually put out uh, energy and it'll tell you how much energy is being put out. But that water has to stay in there a certain amount of time, you know, uh, or else it's not gonna work. This is a fairly small unit. A bigger unit, something like this, will be actually embedded. Like, look at all the lights in there. It will be embedded in a treatment stream. So uh, water will be running down uh, a treatment stream or uh, a chamber, and these bulbs will be sitting in here. Again, as an operator, you can't directly look into this. You have to have glasses so you're not damaging your eyes. But basically, the water will be flowing through these banks of lights, and that's what would do it. And so for maintenance, you'd pull that whole rack of lights out of there and to do servicing and stuff. But it's a super important that all that water is clean and not turbid, so it, it's very effective. The problem though with UV, again, no residual. Once it leaves here, there's no protection. There's no protection in your reservoir. There's no protection in your pipes. The job is done, boom, that's it. So in order to have residual protection, um, plants and systems will have to add chlorine after this. Now, keep in mind, you can add way less chlorine because there shouldn't be any more organics or uh, bacteria in that water. So you only have to add a little bit to keep that chlorine residual. So I would say if I'm using UV that it would have less combined chlorine. Uh, because, or less smell, because this process happened before. But it doesn't replace chlorine, and you're still going to have to use it to meet requirements. And that requirement is to have residual protection in every home. We'll talk a little bit about ozone. Now, ozone is, uh, in my mind, the most fantastic oxidizer. Um, there's not a lot of treatment plants that use ozone, but I do see it a lot in treatment processes for um, industrial or pools use it a fair bit. It's chemical free. It's an oxidizer. It does a great job of oxidizing organics and oxidizing uh, chloramines and oxidizing any sort of anything that's in there. It's fantastic. Um, commonly nature, again, when lightning strikes, right? and 
you'll smell that smell when it first rains, right? That's that ozone smell. The ozone layer up in the sky, it's the upper atmosphere, it provides that protective barrier against solar radiation. Basically what happens is that we basically, it's generated on site uh, by passing oxygen or dry air through a system of high voltage electrodes. So basically what air is made up of oxygen and nitrogen, and that's O2 and N2. What we really want here is those O2s, right? And so if we zap those O2s with high voltage electricity, they split into a bunch of O's. Now, these O's don't like being by themselves. So what they end up doing is that when they split all apart, they come together and some of them combine with other O2s to become O3. Ozone is only second to fluorine as the most powerful oxidant. This stuff is fantastic, but there's a problem though sometimes and I'll speak to that in a second. It activates and oxidizes everything, everything, metals, uh, pumps, pipes, tanks, you name it, it's fantastic, but it's almost too fantastic. It acts as a flocculating agent. It polishes the water. It oxidizes metals so that the water's super clear. But again, no residual protection. It's a one-time thing. Boom, it's done. There, you will still have to add chlorine. But like chlorine does, remember when chlorine oxidized those chloramines? This will do it. It's gone. It does, you will have to add very little chlorine because it, everything else is taken care of. But chlorine still has to be added for residual protection. So basically you got an oxygen generator and that's going to create the O2. Inside the ozone generator, <clears throat> that's that, what they call a corona discharge, and that's that high voltage electrons, right? It's gonna, it's gonna split all these up. So this is where the O3 is created in this ozone generator. Now, here's the important part. Water is gonna, that you wanna treat is gonna come in the top, and it's gonna go down, and out it goes. And, it's important for us now, and I'm gonna use blue for the ozone. Ozone's gonna come through here, through the ozone generator, and it's gonna go up, and it's gonna bubble up. In here, it's gonna to react together. So as the water's traveling down, the ozone's traveling up, and the oxidation happens. The problem is that this ox uh, ozone will have to leave. Ozone doesn't stop reacting. So if you just vent it to the room, it will actually eat the metals and the wires and everything else that you have in that room. So you have to destroy it or vent it away. Usually what they use is UV. They'll have a little UV light and it will actually destroy the um, ozone before it can be properly discharged. So. Keep that in mind that if you're using that, it has to go through some sort of treatment process to deactivate it because just don't vent it out. It will actually make a big mess. And that's ozone. One big thing about ozone is that it does not relieve, uh, have that secondary residual protection. So. Uh, where I look at some of this stuff is, and we'll talk about contact time in a second, but contact time is really important. Um, if, and that is that contact of the water and the disinfectant to make sure that you're deactivating everything. So if you don't have a lot of room or your first customer is really closed, you can use UV or ozone to reduce the time that the water has to be in a contact chamber. And that's why they use it sometimes. It's fantastic. And again, we talked about some of these new bacteria like cryptosporidium that cannot be killed with uh, conventional uh, chlorine. So these can do that job 
and then the chlorine is in there just for residual protection only, which makes a lot of sense. On the flip side though, so when we start dealing with some of these uh, byproducts of chlorine, and there's some byproducts that actually get formed. So again, you gotta, you gotta balance these risks, right? We hear a lot of these byproducts. And this is the reason why people are looking for alternatives to chlorine, right? These are disinfection byproducts or, or DBPs, okay? And again, for you guys in, in you know, in the treatment processes, in the, in the distribution systems, this is, a, this is a challenge right now. Again, it's a victory, right? Like we, I would rather have chlorine in protection so nobody gets sick. But now because we add chlorine, there's some potential pitfalls here. So we gotta kind of think about that. In the past 30 years, um, there's been lots of these families of disinfection byproducts that have been there. And again, a lot of this comes from combining <coughs> chlorine or, um, with or organic matter. My personal opinion on this is that if we do a really good job of removing the organics before we chlorinate, we can really cut down on the amount of disinfection byproducts created. So if I have organics in my water source, we're gonna get those out. So for those of you who are gonna be taking the rest of my water treatment uh, uh, lectures, we'll talk about how we get rid of some of this stuff so that we don't create these disinfection byproducts because we don't want them. They should be gone. So, a lot of places have looked at employing different tactics. And these tactics could be uh, what we just talked about, ozone or UV, um, to reduce disinfection byproducts. To me, let's do a good job of treatment, whether we're going to remove the color and organics through treatment processes, filters, or whatever needs to happen to make sure that water is nice and clean and clear and free of a lot of organics so we, that we don't disinfect them. So something to think about. Once they're created, they're super hard to get rid of. So we want to make sure that we're doing a good job up front. The big one here is called a trihalomethane or a THM. And this forms when chlorine is used. Um, it, it reacts with the humic and fulvic acids. And these are the acids that create the colors in the water, also called organics. <coughs> These are what they call THM precursors. And if these things are uh, present in the water, and usually in surface water, right, that has a lot of organics in it, there's more THM precursors. And these precursors are formed in water when, uh, you know, it could be from algae, leaves, bark, wood, whatever it's gonna be. These uh, materials are responsible for the color and when they combine with chlorine, can, can create potentially these trihalomethanes. What they're saying now that they're possibly, uh, there's links to being cancer causing or carcinogen. So something to really think about. So really make sure we try to get these organics out of there before we add chlorine. Because again, our job is to keep public safe, our customers safe. We don't want to cause issues like this. When you look at all the different THMs out there, one of the one that's used to most or the most widely um, used one is going to be something called chloroform. And chloroform is by far um, the most um, uh, common, I guess, uh, type of THM that I see out there. Again, the current uh, regulation um, out there, and you might see this on the test, is going to be 100 micrograms per liter, or that's also called uh, parts per trillion uh, for total trihalomethanes. And again, that's based on a running average. So they look at not just one sample, but they'll look at a number of samples over a given time. The other family that's fairly new, and again, I see this more and more, is something called haloacetic acids, 
HAAs. And again, this is uh, another uh, disinfection byproduct family like THMs. And again, also possible cancer causing agent. So always be, be aware of that. Talk a little bit about contact time a little bit. So contact time is, is fairly important. In order to make sure your water's safe, it has to have so much time together with the chlorine. So what they're gonna do is using the, the uh, product of the final chlorine residual in the concentration, right, of milligrams per liter in the contact time in minutes. And what it is, it's basically, they're gonna look at 90% of the fluid that goes through your system, right? Um, how, how much contact does that 90% have with the chlorine? So, or the disinfection that you're gonna be using. So they're gonna look at that and they try to figure out how much time. Now, every time you add a barrier or, or say chlorine alternative like UV or ozone, you can cut down on this concept, on this con uh, CT time. So yet you can have a smaller clear well or a smaller footprint for your treatment process. Super important to do. All right, any questions so far? Are we, are we good? Right on. What I'm gonna do now, I'll just, I'm gonna throw a, a little video on. Hopefully it works, just bear with me here. And this video is gonna be of uh, a chlorine process, of my chlorine process. It's what you're gonna see is a sodium hypochlorite process um, on the plant that I run. It's gonna be uh, injected by um, a peristaltic style pump and we're gonna take a quick look at that. So bear with me, I'm just gonna change out the uh, PowerPoint with a video. So just bear with me here. Okay, can you guys see the uh, screen there? You should see two brown doors. If you do, give me a thumbs up, please. I will just make sure that you can also hear it. Good, awesome. So what you have here, this is my plant here in Penticton. And I just put in, I had chlorine gas at one time. And so what I ended up doing is taking uh, the chlorine gas out and I installed these tanks. So what you're gonna see is two 31,000 liter chlorine tanks and they're going to be feeding a peristaltic pump and the reason why I use the peristaltic pump is because chlorine in liquid form will kind of degas so there's a lot of gas that builds up so if you're using a, a different style of pump sometimes you can get an airlock in it so it's really important for me to have a pump that does not be affected by degassing it's a bit noisy in the video and I apologize, but we're gonna take a look at two videos. The first one is this one, and then we'll take a look at where it's injected into my process. So um, hopefully this works. So bear with me. 
It's probably pretty hard to hear, but this is our chemistry alley. Gives you an idea. First room we're gonna go into today, we're gonna go into this disinfection room. Sodium hypochlorite. Like most of the plants out there, we use sodium hypochlorite and we're going to use the 10.8%, also sold as 12%. You can see our tanks here, they're fairly big. These tanks here, I got two of them. They each hold 31,000 liters. They're controlled by a couple of motorized valves here, you can see. And what they're going to do is they're going to feed one of our skids. And you can see here a typical blue-white peristaltic pump skid. And you can see that in there, the rollers rolling on a tube. This is our pre-chlorination one right on this side. And you can see that the tube is running fairly, um, fairly slow, whereas on our other side, this is our post and it's running a little faster. Chlorine's gonna leave through one of the two lines and you can see them up here. The line on the left is our post, where the line on the right is the pre-chlor. Both are gonna go through a flow meter with indications here. And you can see a small little flow meter up here for each. One right there, and one right there. Okay, everybody. All right, so that gives you kind of an idea, right? That's a, that's a fairly large system. Um, you know, <clears throat> even the smaller systems, they'll have smaller tanks, but the premise will be the same. They usually have some sort of tankage uh, that will deliver product through a pump that will take it to uh, an injection port. So we'll do another one more quick video here to show the, uh, um, where it gets injected to. Just got to get there. The yellow uh, line that you see here, this is coming from those chlorine pumps that we saw earlier. So water's coming, or chlorine solution's coming in, and it's going to get injected through two quills right here. Before it heads over under the floor here. And these are two feeds into our clear wells. So pretty simple system. It, um, you know, whether it, that's a small clear well or, or, or large one, everything's gonna be about the same. It's just a little bit bigger. Right, you're going to have products um, being delivered to, and again, when that solution is put into the pipe, it's going to create the acid or ion, depending on the pH. My pH there today was 7.7, .7, so I had a still a good amount of acid uh, to ion relationship, and I was probably injecting. Uh, a chlorine residual of 1.2 milligrams per liter. As it sits in my clear well, um, it, you know, with the contact time, by the time it comes out, I usually aim for 1.30, leaving my clear well out to my distribution. Because my distribution network is so large, again, it's important that I have that 0.2 at every home. So that's that's uh, something to be aware of, depending on your system. I do have two points of rechlorination because of the long uh, runs and the amount of time that that water is out in the system. Um, it, it just sometimes, it, you know, it, it takes a lot of time. I produce probably in a typical day about 40 million liters a day um, with uh, overall capacity of 88 million liters. So, all right. So that's all for uh, my uh, lecture for today. For you guys, um, 
there should be a quiz that's in your books or in your package um, uh, in, the, in the stuff you have. There is a quiz on disinfection. There's uh, 22 questions in there that you can kind of work through. Uh, when my treatment guys are back on next week, we'll be going through those first thing, as well as some of the quiz stuff that we went through on uh, day two. And for the distribution folk, uh, Mike, um, I'll let him know uh, that I've given you guys these questions and he can go over the disinfection questions with you uh, next week. So that's all I have for the lecture today. Um, I hope you enjoyed that and I hope we learned something uh, about disinfection today. Yeah, thank you, um, Mike. Next week we resume um, well water treatment. It'll be at 8 a.m. as usual, and water distribution will be back at 3 p.m. Please know that I will send the notices. I know sometimes we get confused. And for some of you who are interested, we're following this session now. We have a our Kawasa Wednesday webinars are back. And so we will be on this afternoon at 4 p.m. from 4 p.m. So you can check us out. I've sent the links out already. Just in case you're interested, you could if you didn't get the link, you could shoot me an email and we will forward that to you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you again, Mike. Thanks, everybody.